Across the land, they've been waiting long for a healing hand. The was there, and I felt the chill. Your love came down, and the earth stood still. Your love came down and the earth stood still.
Glory to God. Do we have any visitors with us for the very first time? If you would just wave at us, we'll make sure you get a visitor's packet. Anybody? You all been here before? 
I see a hand back there. I see another hand back there. Yeah. You know, and I thought I saw a strange couple come in. They looked a lot like Ken and Don Matheson, but I wasn't sure it was them or not. So that, you know, perhaps they could get a visitor's packet as well. <laughs> get that man a visitor's packet right over there, that guy right there. Justin, would you like to come pray over the offering, please? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You're waiting for another, Justin, were you? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you for another opportunity to give into your kingdom this morning, Father. On this day when we come together to celebrate the greatest gift of all, Lord God, we know that you're not after our funds, Lord God, but you're after our heart. You gave everything you had when you gave your only son, Father God. So this is just a small token of our gratitude and our appreciation that we can give back to you, Father God. We thank you so much. For this wonderful time of year, we declare, Lord God, that your glory will be done in this place and in this city, Father God, that your will will be done. That everything that you've come, that you've spoken will come to pass in our lives, Lord God, as we read your word and declare your word in faith, Lord God, we know that it is at work in our lives and it's producing fruit in our lives, Lord God. And as we sow, we know we're going into good soil this morning, Father, so we thank you for that. We call it an abundant harvest to everyone who sows this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I always like to point out at this time of the year that um, Jesus was born in late September, and uh, not to ruin your Christmas, but to provoke you to read your Bible. You know, and you can prove that through Scripture, and I'm not even going to show you how to do that. Because the Bible says that in the last days there would be seducing spirits and doctrines of devils being preached by very famous, well-known preachers, and so... Basically, what he's saying is you better know your Bible for yourself. You don't need to be taking anybody's word. Don't base your life on what someone has said. Base your life on the Word of God. And when you hear something that you don't know, take the time and search it out. Your life is depending on it, right? It's your life. So, so he, he was born in September, and he was, you know, in the fall festivals, and we know that because John the Baptist was born in the spring festivals, and so there was a correlation, the six-month difference in their lives and all that. And, and then the nativity scene that most of you look at is wrong, too, because the wise men didn't show up until Jesus was at least a year old. It was a pedion in the, in the Greek. Pedion is like a, where, you, where you get pediatrics. And, and they didn't come to a manger scene or a sukkah. They came to the house where he was living. And so, and uh, they brought enough money to fund that ministry for a long, long time as well. So there's all kinds of things in there that you need to take the time to find out. And I'm not going to do any of that today. So, no, I want to talk to you today about why he came. When he came is, you know, not so consequential as why. And he came for you. And I, and I relate it with a couple of stories. The first one is my own, of course, because it's very close to me. My story is close to me. And uh, I, five or six years ago, I was driving along the sea of the shores of the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias. Actually, I'd left the town of Tiberias, and I was on my way over to Capernaum or Capernaum, the village where Jesus uh, set up his ministry headquarters. And on the way to there, as you get down the, near the end of the lake, there's a big mountain there that overlooks the whole lake. And um, I had the windows down in the rental car because the spring fragrance was just blowing through, the, you know, it was just amazing how the, the, the smells. And uh, anyways, I was driving under that mountain. God spoke to my heart. I don't mean I heard him, hey, Hooper. None of that. No, it was in here. And uh, I knew that that was the mountain where he saw his disciples on the fourth watch of the night caught in a storm. And he came walking to them. You know, you, you know the story. He came walking to them, walking on the water, and came to rescue them. And when I was pondering that, he said, I saw you from there as well. You know, thousands of years ago, he saw me in a storm of alcohol and drug addiction. And he came walking 
into a drug dependency center and pulled me out. So yeah, he was born in a sukkah or a manger, however you want to look at it. But how was he born into your life? I, I pray that you have an experience with God. If you grew up in church, then you need to seek an experience with God because, because you need that vital hookup. I don't mean you go sin just so that you can have a good testimony like me. I'm not talking about that. But you need to, But you, we can become familiar. Joshua, in verse, chapters 22, 23, 24 of his book, he gave his, the people a great motivational speech about what it was going to be like after he was gone, and he encouraged them. And then when you get to Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, it says the next generation totally forgot everything that God had done. You know, so they became complacent. They became uh, easy Christianity, go to church on Sunday and do everything else all week long. And, and because, there's no, because there's no repentance in the gospel that's being preached today, uh, you can just live any way you want to as long as you touch base on Sunday. That's just so far from the truth. People will go to hell thinking they were all right, you know. And we need to realize that he came and he paid a great price for your redemption. As a matter of fact, in Corinthians chapter 6, it says that you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. He purchased you. And he purchased you. Matter of fact, if we go to, if we, let's go to Isaiah chapter, where we were last Sunday. I think it was chapter 7. Well, in chapter 7 and verse 14, it's a good verse to look at as well, because this was 700 years before Jesus was born. And it says, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel or God with us. Pretty powerful, isn't it? But then if you jump over to chapter 9, verse 6, it says, for unto us a child is born, but a son is given. So the child was born in the manger or in the sukkah. We know it was a sukkah. He was born in those fall festivals. And he, and he came into a very dangerous, hostile environment. Matter of fact, Herod tried to kill him, killed everybody under two years old trying to get him. Uh, it was under Roman rule. It was not. And again, I, I, as I pointed out last week, there were no hotel reservations. God brought his son and put him into the earth. He didn't, he didn't hook him up with, uh, you know, the Sheridan or any of those hotels. He... He didn't even, he didn't even make, a, make a place for him to stay. And, you know, and, and that's significant because God always works with impossible situations and he works in hard places. And we pointed out last week how, you, you know, even with Abraham, his wife Sarah was barren. And then Isaac had a son Rebecca, and he married Rebecca. She was barren. And then Jacob had a wife named Rachel and she was barren. And then we got all the way up into Zechariah and Elizabeth and Elizabeth was barren. And then you got a virgin that's going to conceive. And the angel describes the situation to Mary and says, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you. And, and, and she said, well, that's good. Be it unto me according to your word. She had no idea what she was told, but she accepted the word of God. She didn't, <laughs> no, would, to be, would to God that we would be that quick to accept it instead of analyzing it and, and, and trying to dissect it. No, no, she said, Matter of fact, there's two words that weren't even translated out of the Greek in there. The words pan rhema. And that means according to your word. And what Gabriel was saying is, I can do this now because you've given me your word. Because you said, let it be unto me according to your word. Now I can do it because there's a covenant cooperation. That's how you get born again. You know, Jesus died for the whole world. We heard that in the songs today. But until you make that personal hookup, until you say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, you can go to hell and split hell wide open, even though the provision was made for you. The price was paid, and it was a high price. And when you think about Jesus dying in Calvary, even though this is his birth we're celebrating, you, rem you remember what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that it was equal value, something of equal value had to die to get you. Matter of fact, Peter said it wasn't with gold or silver or anything like that. There wasn't enough gold. There wasn't enough silver on the earth to redeem you. There wasn't enough. So he needed, and it wasn't an angel. He didn't send an angel to die for you. He birthed a son into the earth, something of equal value. Something, someone that the Bible calls the last Adam. The first Adam before he sinned was perfect. And then the second Adam came to undo what the first Adam had caused, and to restore, Hebrews 2.10 says, to restore many sons back to 
glory. So he didn't come to pull out the gun. He came to restore you back to glory. Matter of fact, even in Romans 3.23, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is hamartia. It means you missed the mark. It means you missed it. How many of you know you can miss it in life? You can miss it in life. And, and so they missed the mark. But the next verse says, we, I'm going to go there. We'll come back to Isaiah. Romans chapter uh, 3, verse 24. Verse 24, I'll help you out. Some of you need help. I can see it on your face, right? You need help. <laughs> it's okay to need help. Yeah, so all of sin, verse 24, being justified. What does justified mean? We all know the little, the little phrase. Just as if I had never missed it, just as if I had never failed, just as if I had never sinned. Therefore, being justified freely. Freely is the word Doreen. It means without cause or condition. It means you just accept it. You accept the fact that you've been justified freely through the redemption that is in your good looks or your good acts, or what does it say there? In Christ Jesus. And then verse 25, it says, who was brought forth as a propitiation. That word propitiation is, simply means the mercy seat, if you understand anything about the holy place. It, it, through faith in, look, through faith in his blood, not faith in your works, not faith in what you're doing, but faith in what he's done. So unto us, a child was born, and unto us, a son was given, so that, so that that son, that son that came, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he, God made him, Jesus, that son that was given, to be sin for us, even though he knew no sin, that you would be made the righteousness of God in Christ, even though you, ha even though you hadn't done it right. He hadn't done it wrong and you hadn't done it right, but there was an exchange made. He took everything that was wrong with you and you took everything that was right with him. Now, come on, if you don't want to get in with a deal like that, how do I get in? How do I get in? You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you are saved. Well, it should be more complicated than that. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't write the book. It doesn't say you've got to pass out tracts. It doesn't say... You got a time to give offerings in the local church. It doesn't say you even have to go to the local church. Those things you will do <laughs> because your heart will draw you there. It won't be some kind of religious activity trying to please some God that, that, that you, you know, God is already pleased. <laughs> You're not doing anything to please him. You, you know, propitiation also means satisfied. He's satisfied that the sin question has been canceled. Now, that, does that mean that I go and practice sin? No, of course not. We're not talking about that. But my heart's desire has changed. Do I, do I get it all right every day? No, I already messed up this morning. How about you? Some of y'all, I saw you in the car coming to church. Don't you act so holy. <laughs> See, it's not about that. It's about receiving the gift. Romans 5, 17 says, receive the gift of righteousness and then you will begin to reign in life. Then you begin to take your place in life. Then you'll be able to walk in life and become more than a conqueror that he called you to be because you won't be living in condemnation and shame all the time. You know, when Adam sinned, the first thing that happened to him, the first thing that happened to him, the first thing that happened when he committed high treason against God was he ran and hid and tried to cover himself because he was ashamed. So anytime that you feel in shame, you better, you better shake that off. That's not from God. Conviction, when you've done something wrong, that's God. Condemnation, that's not God. Conviction is, hey, I messed up, I need to get it right. Condem you know, conviction will make me run to God. Condemnation may make me run away. It's so simple, isn't it? Run to him. So anyways, we're going back to Isaiah chapter 9. I want to read you something that uh, I don't like pastors that cry, especially when it's me. <laughs> but there was a song somebody had on Facebook the other day, and it was the little drummer boy, ba rum pa bum bum and uh, so I, I downloaded it and I started to read it. 
It says, come they told me, and I'm not going to do the rumpa bum bum Paul can do that. <laughs> a newborn king to see. Our finest gifts we bring to lay before the king. So to honor him we come. Then the drummer kid says, I'm a poor boy. I have no gift to bring that is fit to give a king. And when I got to that line, I could not stop weeping because that's a true statement. I had nothing to give him, nothing, absolutely nothing. He came into a drug dependency center. He said, I came to get you. <laughs> what, what could I possibly offer him? I was broken. I was three months behind on my rent. <laughs> but rumpa bum bum. <laughs> so I said, Shall I preach for you? But rumpa bum bum. Mary nodded and said, Go ahead, the ox and the lamb, they kept time. I preached for him, but rumpa bum bum. I preached my best for him. Has no he been pretty? Help some people, hurt some people. Look back over 25 years and think, wow, dear God, I could have done better there. I could have done better. There. I'm not talking about living back there. I'm talking about you. So it's good to stop and analyze things because you get to where we'll be in Isaiah chapter 11 in a minute. And I looked and I thought, you know what? There's some things I could have done better. But all I can say is I played my best for him. But the last, the last verse says, then he smiled at me. And he smiled at me. See, you don't have anything to offer him. But Romans 12, 1 says, offer your body unto him a living sacrifice. Holy acceptable unto him as your reasonable service and sit, submit your mind to be renewed by the word of God. Those are the two things that we can, that we can give. I know he got a raw deal in my mind. When he got me, I thought he was, you know, was a bad, but I, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to talk him out of the deal that he made. But I realize in myself, in my flesh, that I got nothing to brag about. Matter of fact, I'm so glad that he gives us crowns of life so that when we get there, we can give them to the one that belongs to them. You know, even, even the, but the way the church, even the church culture today, we've got, we've got famous preachers and, and really to set up for the Antichrist. I don't mean that these people are bad or evil or anything, but we need to stop following preachers and start following the book. Like, you've got to know what's in the book. There's some people out there preaching stuff and have huge crowds, and it's absolute nonsense. Nonsense. But the church just goes happily along. No, read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read it for yourself. Take time every day. You know, manna every day. Every day you feed your physical body. Every day feed your spiritual body. You won't regret it. And go into the, go into the new covenant. You know, if you have a problem studying the Old Covenant, get into the New Covenant. It'll, all the New Covenant is is the old, old Covenant revealed, and there's a lot of truth in there. And mostly stay in the letters that Paul wrote because he wrote them to the church, you know. So you can do that. You can do these things. You just need to make a decision to do them. But anyway, now let's get back to Isaiah. I'm going to try to get into this Christmas message a little bit further. Actually, in chapter 10, verse 27, it says... And it shall come to pass in that day, this is the day we're living in, that his burden shall be taken away from off your shoulder, his yoke from off your neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed Amen. because of the anointing. And that anointing, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Well, that same anointing in Acts 1 and verse 8, it says, Terry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. You re no, actually, that's Luke 24, 49. Acts 1 and verse 8 says that, that the promise of the Father will come unto you, that you receive the power to be a witness unto me. Not a witness unto your neighbor so much as a witness unto him that you'll be a living witness that something good happened in your life, right? And so all those other things grow from that. But now over in Acts chapter, or in Isaiah chapter 11, we looked here last week. He says, there'll come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And we, and we know he's talking about Jesus he's, because he said the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding and the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might and the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord and make him quick and understand the will of God and he'll understand the purpose of God and he won't judge by sight, but he'll be led by the Holy Ghost, right? 
And so that's all in there. But, but, the, but the thing that we pointed out last week, and I want to reiterate it, is that Israel hadn't heard from God since Malachi. So over 300 years of silence, the tree had been cut off. There was nothing there but a stump. But the roots were still there. And, as long, and you know, so maybe you've had, not had a banner year. Uh, maybe you've had even a bit of, of a bitter year. I, I look at 2017 in my own life and, and thinking it was, it was really great and really sucked. No, it was really great and it really sucked. Have you ever had those experiences? Like there's some things that were so painful and, some, and yet other things that were so great. But, but I realized also that, you know, the, the Lord talks about pruning and about lopping off things that are not productive in your life. And, and uh, we, we don't like those verses. We don't like what Paul said. Paul said, I am pressed on every side. That means he didn't just have pressure here. He would turn here and he had pressure. He turned here and he had pressure. How many of you have ever experienced that kind of pressure? It, it just, it's unrelenting. And yet he said, yet he said, but I've got this treasure in an earthen vessel. He said, I got something going on on the inside of me that's greater than what's going on without. He said, and he said, the things that are coming against me are temporal. They are subject to change. But the things that are happening to me on the eternal side, they'll produce forever. They'll produce forever. He said, and then he gets to chapter five and he says, and this is why I walk by faith and not by sight. He realized, as we talked a couple of weeks ago about Psalm 23, he said, I'll lead you in paths of righteousness for my name's sake. Then the next, part, next verse says, and yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, you know, why did he put that in there? I don't like that verse. I like led in paths of righteousness. Who thought that the paths of righteousness would lead me through all of that trouble? so that I could get a table prepared before me, even in the presence of my enemies, and that my cup would run over with oil. No, no, we like it easy. We like it light, because his yoke is easy and his burden light. And it is, you just follow him. But that's over in the realm of the spirit. If you're walking around the natural, you're going to get slapped a little bit. <laughs> you get slapped over into the realm of the spirit, I guess. So it might have been a bummer year. It might have been a banner year. But the thing that I notice about this and when is like, here's this tree, it's been reduced to nothing. But when you've been reduced to nothing, God is up to something. God is up to something in your life. Expect a 2018 that is over the top, especially if you've been tribulated in 17. I love testimonies. I don't like to test. How many of you do? I love telling people about this building, how we got it and how we got it debt free. Oh, what a wonderful story. Walking it out sucked hard, I don't mind telling you. It wasn't pretty. Faith isn't pretty, faith is ugly. So here's this, here's this tree mowed down. And the Spirit of God comes out of that. And then even down to verse 10, it says, in that day, the root of Jesse. So he's talking about Jesus being the one that grows out of the stump, but he's also the root of the stump because he's the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the olive and the top. So he's all of that. And so, so he says that he'll come. So then, you know, so then when you, you find yourself, and again, I think I used this illustration because it really stands out to me. Nancy decided to prune, and she's not, I don't know if she's ever done this in her life. Did you ever do that before? She's nodding her head, yes, but it didn't look like it. No, no we got, I don't even know what these bushes are. They grow in the front yard, and I mow around them and stuff. You know, that, they're there. And, uh, and, and uh, she went and pruned that thing back, and it looked like just empty branches sticking out everywhere. But it worked. And so sometimes in your life, all we see when we look at you is ugly branches sticking. No, no, we don't see that. <laughs> no, no, just trust him. Just trust him. You know, he'll use examples like, I love in Matthew chapter 6, he's, he's walking along, he's teaching them, you know, about thoughts and cares and stuff. And he uses an object lesson. He says, consider the birds. He didn't say consider the bills. He didn't say consider your problems. Consider the doctor's report. He didn't say any of that. He said consider the birds. He said I know every one of them. 
and not one of them would fall to the ground that I don't know about. Aren't you much more valuable than they are? Duh. And then, and then Lazarus, John chapter 11, Lazarus, his friend, is sick. And so when he hears the report, here's Christ, the healer, he doesn't even leave. He stays at his own place for four days. What kind of compassion is that? He waited four days until the guy was graveyard dead and buried in the graveyard when he showed up. Why did he do that? As an object lesson to you to show you that your dead things can be resurrected too. Those are object lessons for you and I. There's no such thing as a dead thing in God. He'll show up and speak to it and bring it back to life. No, you got to know that. You got to get that down your spirit. You, if you're still breathing, man, it's not over. Something good is happening for you. Something good is going on. Something good is going on right now in your life. How do I know that? Because you're here this morning to hear this message, and this is not Gary's message. This is God's message to you saying, something good is happening. Well, it sure doesn't look good, doesn't feel good. What does look and feel have to do with anything? Did it help you so far? No, of course not. So he's the beginning and the end. And uh, maybe you've been... Well, God does things the hard way. Can we just go over to Judges chapter 6? I'm not going to preach all day. I cut this four-hour message down to two hours so you can relax. Last week, I stopped preaching fast because Jean and Marie were cooking in the kitchen. And then they told me, what are you doing in here already? We expected you to preach till quarter to one. Oh, wow, it's only what? Five, oh, awesome. What time is it? It's only 1130. I'm trying to find Judges chapter six. Judges chapter six and verse six says this. Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, I brought you up out of Egypt, I brought you out of the house of bondage, I brought you out of alcohol and drug addiction, I brought you out of that back room down in Port Bickerton, I brought you out. I brought you out. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you to drive them out before you and gave them your land. And he said, I am the Lord your God. Fear not. The gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But, but they didn't obey his voice. And then verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak tree named Oprah that pertained to jo Joash and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So we call this guy the man of, of paste and flour because he's sifting wheat somewhere, hiding where you're supposed to be up on a hill on a threshing floor so that the wind will blow the chaff away and the wheat will land on your, on your, on your carpet. And so, but he's not doing that. He's hiding in fear and trying to, trying to just to give, just trying to get by. Just trying to, Make it to the end of the year. Make it to the end of the month. Just trying to, trying to get by. And then, and then this is what happens. All of a sudden, in the middle of all this, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, you sniveling coward. I can't believe you're hiding here. No, God doesn't do that. He speaks to your potential. Oh, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. That's how he sees you. He sees you as a champion. How do I know that? Because his word tells us all the way through. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in your circumstances. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and never underneath. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. I'm steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. I know my labor's not in vain in the Lord. Thanks be to God who always gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He says it over and over again to try and instill in us the fact that we're not, we're, we're not inferior. We're superior to anything that we're facing. 
So, so he says here, so he, here he is, he's threshing. He said, O oh, mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh, praise the Lord. No, he had the wine on. Then he had the wine on. And how does the wine come? Well, it's like this. He'd been struggling for a while. He, he, had, he, he didn't have, he, he held on to the glass of water and it didn't weigh all that much. Matter of fact, if you hold on for, to it for five or 10 minutes, it's not a problem. But what happens if you hang on to it for two or three hours? What happens if you hang on to that little thing right there all day? Now, all of a sudden, your whole body is being affected and you're in stress and in strain because you won't let something go. They wouldn't believe the word of God. That's why he was threshing where he was threshing. They were hanging on to their fearful moments. They were hanging on to their inferiority. They were hanging on to, uh, you, you know, the, the, the main fear that we have is I, I won't have enough or I am not enough. Those are the two things that everybody faces. I'm not enough or I don't have enough. And God took care of both of those when he brought you in Christ. Blessed you with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Made you that, you know, put you above all principality and power and might and dominion and all that. So anyway, here's Gideon. He said, oh my God, if you're really here, then why? <laughs> why? Ever hear you say why? Don't look for a reason. Don't ever look for a reason. Look for a revelation. There's a revelation in what you're facing. You know, Paul comes in Acts chapter 26, gets washed ashore on the island of Malta after being in a storm for over two weeks. They finally get to shore, and, uh, he's, and the people of the island are building a fire, and he's there trying to help out and get dried out. And when he goes to throw a log on the fire, a snake grabs a hold of him in public and hangs on to him in public. And they think, this guy must be a devil. He just survived the storm, and now the snake bit him. Then after they watched it for a little while, they said, hmm, he didn't die. Maybe he's a god. That's the fickle crowd. But the, the, the point of that message was that he took that bad thing that happened to him and, and brought revival to an island. No, no, but you need to know that when bad things happen, good things happen. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for your good when you love the Lord and you're called according to his purpose. That means, so if all things are working together for good, that means not everything is good. So we're going to pour some good in there, and we're going to pour some bad in there, and we're going to pour some good and pour some bad, shake it all up. It looks like a mess. But God says all of those things, even though I didn't bring them, let no man say when he's tempted, tested, or tried with evil, he's tempted by God. He said, I didn't do that, but he said, I'll bring good out of that if you'll stay with me. If you'll trust me in this, I'll walk you through this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not camping out there. I'm moving on, moving on. Oh, I think I'll just stop here for a while. No, keep moving. If you're going through hell, don't stop. Where are the miracles? Where, where, where are they? Why is this befallen us? We don't, haven't seen any miracles. You can't see any miracles if you stand, sit in an unbelief somewhere anyway. You know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Number one, you believe he exists. Number two, he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So they were wondering where the miracles were, and they were living, they were living just like everybody else. There was no difference in them than there were the people down the street. They were living the same. Where are the miracles that our fathers told us about? Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us unto the hands of the Midianites. <laughs> so this is a very humiliating circumstance, you know. This is not pretty. But I think, I, I think the key thing is you, you remember the word, you listen to your fathers, and it qualifies you for leadership. You know, if you listen to this, what he's saying here, it will empower you. It won't, it won't take you down. And the Lord looked upon him and said, so, so here's a guy crying over answers. And God says to him, you go fix it. You just told him all the reasons why it, 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 everything sucks. And now he's going to say, you can fix this. What, whatever situation you're in right now, Whatever sphere of influence that's under your domain right now, you can fix anything that you're facing right now. Stop crying to God and start taking charge of your life. 
Oh God, please, please, please. No, no, no. You go in, look at this. Go in this thy might and you shall save not just yourself, but everybody around you from the hand of the Midianites. And then he says this, have I not sent you? Didn't he tell you, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Didn't he tell you in in Mark chapter 16, he said, I'll give you a synopsis of the book of Acts. He said, in my name, you'll cast out devils. You'll speak with new tongues. You'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That might include yourself. Well, I tried and it didn't work. Well, don't stop trying. Make it work. No, there's nobody else going to make it work for you. Get a hold of this. There's nobody else going to fix your problem. Oh, God, please fix my problem. I empowered you. I did it all at Calvary. I did it all. I said it is finished. I'm seated at the Father's right hand expecting my enemies to be made my footstool. Hebrews 1.13, Hebrews 10.13 says the same thing. He's seated. seated. When you're seated, that means you're done. Right? It means I've already done everything for you. Now get it in the word and apply it to your life. Get it in your word and apply it to your life and you can have a great 2018. Does that mean I won't have any problems? Who said that? <laughs> you might have some new ones. Life without problems is a, is a graveyard. <laughs> it's over, man. Huh? Heaven is a, pl- a life without problems. But, you know, that's why he said in, in John, 1 John 5, 4, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Then he said in John uh, uh, six, uh, 14, verse 33, he said, uh, he said in, in me, well, let's go there. In me, you'll have peace. I'm going to stop over there because... That's the message that the angels brought. Is it John 14 or John 16, 33? One or the other. 16, right? Yeah. See, and this verse gets misquoted lots and lots of times because we, 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 we quote part of it. We quote, in the world you have tribulation that be a good cheer. I've overcome the world for you. But you can't leave out that first part of that verse. He said, in me, you'll have peace. Why? Because Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not a physical thing. It's not a, t- a tangible thing in that way. I can't touch it with my senses. But he said, the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink. It's not a ritual, a ritual that you go through in a church service even. He said, my kingdom is not meat nor drink, but it's righteousness He, God, made him to be sin for us and knew no sin that we'd be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Righteousness. And then he said, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So what are you saying there? You're righteous in the Holy Ghost. You have peace in the Holy Ghost. And you've got joy in the Holy Ghost. When you're in the Holy Ghost, this is what he's talking about right here. He said, in me, you'll have peace. Doesn't matter what's going on around you over this holiday or any other time, it doesn't matter what's going on around you, in me, when I'm in him, I have peace. If I feel my peace leaving, what am I supposed to do? Get back in him. In me, you have peace. How will I know the difference? How will I know when I left his peace? I'm in the world and I'm getting tribulated. (laughs) I feel tribulated. Well, step over here. Get out the way. No, no, if the, if the truck is coming, oh, the truck is coming, the truck is coming, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> get, out get out of the way. Just get out of the way, and you can make that mental decision. This is why he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4, 5, and 6, he said, he said the weapons of your warfare are not natural, aren't carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds, things that try to get a stronghold in your mind, worrying about this and fretting about that and worrying about the other thing until it begets a, becomes a fortress in your brain. He said, no, no. He said, that's a stronghold. He said, you can get rid of that by casting down that imagination and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God or the book or the word of God and bring your thought life back into captivity. Because if you're not controlling your thoughts, let me ask you, who is? No, no, take responsibility for for what you're thinking. And when you change what you're thinking, you'll change what you're speaking and you'll change what you're doing and you'll change how you're living. It all, but, but the onus is, it's not on God. It's on us. 
He, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He came on purpose and for a purpose. And when the angel showed up, and here he is, he's being born with all of the other temple lambs that temple shepherds are watching over there five miles from Jerusalem over in Bethlehem. They are the temple shepherds making sure that the lambs that they have for sacrifice are without spot and blemish. And Jesus is born right there while they were watching those same flocks by a night. He came and got zeroed in there. And when the angels showed up, what did they say? Where, no, no, this is a religion's concept of God. I'm here to get you now. No, no. the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Religion has messed it all up. The message is peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Well, you better get saved, you're going to hell. That may be true, but that's not the message. Gospel means good news. In fact, gospel means good news from the battlefield. What's good news from the battlefield? We won. Amen. Praise the Lord. We won and I'm done. It's a good spot to stop right there.